Next one up, we have Project Vesta. And again, I'll give you the five minute warning. Project Vesta, please take the stage. Thank you, Alison. Uh, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all. Uh, just before I start, I just want to give a big thank you to the Foresight team for uh, for organizing this accelerator. It's been super powerful. Uh, to the mentors for giving uh, giving your time so generously. It's been it's been really great. And also to the other teams who've really, uh, I think everyone's really approached this in the spirit of, of collaboration rather than as a competition, um, which, of course, we all need to work together to, to heal the planet. So let me share my screen here. Oh, I need some permission, I think, Alison or Lou, to share my screen. Thank you. Okay, so jumping jumping right in, um, it, we obviously don't have that long, so we've really had to prioritize in terms of in terms of what to share, both about the project and in terms of the progress we've made over the last four weeks. So um, recognizing that, uh, jumping in. So divided this presentation into into two sections. The first is uh, the sort of goals and technical overview, and the second is really focusing on what's been what's been new over the last four weeks. So brief review of the problem and solution here. The problem is we're losing our planet to climate change and there's really no viable solutions yet. The solution is to remove tens of gigatons per year of carbon dioxide by accelerating the Earth's natural carbon removal process using olivine. So our goals as a project. So prove the science of coastal enhanced weathering or CEW in the ocean environment in order to develop it as a mature solution for climate change. Um, and so there are three goals within that. One is proof that it works. <clears throat> so demonstrate that it's safe and measure how quickly it works in the ocean ecosystem. Uh, the second is really make it repeatable. There's no point in doing this once. We need to develop a way to enable governments, NGOs, and companies to deploy it globally with predictable results. And then the third is to see the scaling ecosystem, enable this repeatable technology to actually be scaled globally to reverse climate change. <clears throat> so where we are today is it's been proven that it works in the lab. The, chem the basic chemistry is, is fully demonstrated. What we need to do is prove it works in the open system. We need to make it repeatable, and then we need to see the ecosystem. Right now, we're at a technology readiness level of about four. We need to continue to develop it and take it through to seven, at which point global deployment and scaling can begin. A very quick technical review, uh, given time. Essentially, we're accelerating a natural process. So we take olivine, we can take it to a beach or coastal shelf sea. And what's key there is that the wave energy and sediment transport causes particle collisions, which accelerate the natural chemical reaction of carbon dioxide removal. So uh, this set of pictures on the top shows you coarse olivine on the one behind, and then you put it in a desktop shaker and it turns into this fine fraction. And that's what enables the chemical reaction at the bottom of this page to happen, which is shifting the chemical equilibrium in solution from carbonic acid to bicarbonate, enabling more carbon dioxide to be pulled out of the atmosphere and enabling marine calcifying organisms to use the bicarbonate uh, in their shells and skeletons. Uh, we've done pretty extensive work on the scalability here. There are no fundamental constraints in terms of the amount of olivine, the availability of shelf seas, and we believe that at a very large scale, this could get down as cheap as $10 a ton of carbon dioxide removal, which would, of course, be fantastic. Um, so double-clicking a little bit on the goals here. So goal number one, proving it works. So there's a picture here of the Project Vesta pilot beach, and actually Eric Matzner, one of our uh, co-founders is on location there right now. So we're super excited um, that uh, that this is moving forward. And we've got a number of other studies planned as well. So ecotoxicology study, a study at the natural olivine beach in Papakalea, various uh, growth studies looking at uh, the effect of olivine on marine calcifying organisms, uh, a closed system study. So we can actually measure the carbon dioxide literally coming out of the air and seeing it going into the water. And then numerous experimental beach studies, uh, not just this first pilot beach, but other ones as well. So double clicking on goal number two, making it repeatable. Um, what we really need to do here is create what we're calling uh, the CWAM, the, the Coastal Enhanced Weathering Integrated Assessment Model. And so what that is, 
is an algorithm and a protocol that enables this to be repeatable, taking safety data and in particular taking weathering rate data from multiple different sources, both the laboratory closed system study and uh, different experimental sites around the world with different conditions. So how does temperature affect the weathering rate? How does wave energy, how does the slope of a, of a beach affect the weathering rate? And taking all of this together so we can know how much carbon dioxide will be removed per year depending on the site and what are the amount of emissions that we're going to be creating in this process to make sure that the uh, to make sure that the capture is strongly net net negative um, and to make sure that uh, we understand the life cycle assessment properly so creating a set of tools that make this repeatable and then the the third goal around seeding a scaling ecosystem a couple of things to say about this the first is having a broad scientific license for it and so we're currently uh, working with a number of collaborators on a CEW review paper to feed into the IPCC's assessment report six, which will come out in 2022. And that will be um, a key factor in the, uh, um, in the global stock take starting in 2022, which was agreed to in the Paris Agreement. So we're really trying to make sure that this process uh, gets broad, uh, broad support from the scientific community and the overall carbon capture into governmental community. Now I'd just like to cover um, again. There's, there's not enough time to cover everything we've we've um, all the insights we've got over the last four weeks and all of the um, all of the progress we've made. But um, a few things on what's new. So on this third goal of seeding a scaling ecosystem, you know, what we need to do to, the, to do this at scale. You know, this is a planetary huge planetary scale problem, and so we're going to need huge planetary scale solutions here. So. Looking at the supply chain here on the top half, the, uh, the extraction of olivine, taking it through grinding and transportation to deployment at scale. Uh, so this little map you're seeing is um, the British Isles and some neighboring countries. And this is an area where if we put a one centimeter thick of olivine over all of that shelf C, that will be enough to remove the annual emissions of all of those neighboring countries. And so making that happen would be a, a large effort it is doable, but in order to do that, we need a uh, we need an ecosystem to exist. So we need a way to rigorously audit and monitor the deployments to uh, to ensure that the carbon dioxide is being captured. We need the carbon credits that result from this to be to be sold both into the voluntary markets and ultimately into into um, obligatory compliance markets. Uh, you know, of course, we hope that the U.S. will have one of those at some point in the next few years. Um, in order to do this, you know, we're going to need a set of companies to emerge who are going to be executing on this, who are going to be able to deploy the kind of capital at scale that's going to be able to fund these kind of operations and, and who will execute on it responsibly. And responsibly is clearly a key word here. We need to make sure that it's properly audited and monitored. We also need to make sure that, um, that the beginning to end effects are, are done responsibly. So looking at sustainable extraction of olivine, uh, sustainable shipping practices, all of the things that actually go into making this happen need to be, uh, need to be taken into account from an ecological perspective. And we've come up with this idea recently to, um, to potentially incentivize corporate negative emissions purchases to help capitalize the ecosystem. So what I mean by that is, uh, as everybody knows, there's a pretty significant trend at the moment of companies deciding to voluntarily, voluntarily become net zero and in many cases even um, capture all of their historical emissions. So companies who are wanting to purchase these kinds of negative emissions could also participate as investors in this ecosystem and actually get an equity stake in companies that are doing this work and therefore have their own uh, alignment of incentives, make sure that they uh, are part of the ecosystem, not just as a purchase, purchaser, but also as an investor. Um, a, um, a few uh, highlights of some of the other progress we've made uh, over the last few weeks uh, through the mentor meetings. So talking about where to take this next beyond our first pilot beach, looking at uh, going to countries who've already made significant progress on their Paris targets. Um, we're getting an introduction to the Environment Ministry uh, in Abu Dhabi, which is one place um, which, uh, which could be receptive to this. We also got a very helpful uh, recommendation letter from one of the mentors. We've got some really interesting insights on how to build a movement around this. 
a big part of this is the social license for CEW. And so how to create what's called an upside down wedding cake of advocates where we start with a, uh, a small number of uh, very motivated, very uh, invested advocates and have them uh, build the next layer and so on out like an upside down wedding cake. Uh, also an idea to create a premium black sand beach experience because people love black sand beaches uh, using a different ultramafic rock. Uh, potential satellite data collaboration with Planet Labs to, uh, to monitor our deployments, especially once they get to the larger scale. And also refining what, something that's very important here, which is our on-the-ground communication and community engagement approach. This is something that's going to need not just global support, but also local support uh, in order to make it happen. Um, and that is a, that's a quick review of a lot of the progress we've made over the last four weeks. Once again, this is just a, this is just some highlights, but I wanted to make time for questions. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. Amazing. Um, all right. I'll stop sharing your screen. Wow. Also, thank you to both of you for totally sticking in the time limit. I couldn't have like timed it better. Thank you so much. Okay. Q and A, who would like to ask a question? Please feel free to just go for it and unmute yourself. Let's talk biosecurity because that is, if we're talking about large scale transport of minerals from one region to another, um, biosecurity concerns come up even for serpentine, um, not just asbestos, but also the heavy metals and stuff and the environments where the serpentine come from. So my question is, have you thought about, in addition to the um, interface issues, the ocean shore interface issues in geochemistry or biogeochemistry, but also the biosecurity issues that might, that might pertain here? Yeah, so if I, if I, understand, the, if I understand the question correctly, um, ecological impacts and so on, um, and, and that's going to vary by the source of rock. So anywhere we, anywhere we do this from a deployment standpoint, um, and, you know, to use an example of our first pilot beach, we're not just measuring biogeochemistry, we're actually uh, measuring the effect on the local marine ecosystem, uh, including taking, uh, you know, following key species, taking, you know, even tissue samples of key species to understand exactly what's going on there and to make sure that, you know, any traces of, of uh, metals are uh, not ending up uh, in those and are not uh, causing adverse effects. Uh, it's also going to vary by the source of the rock. And so every, every source will have to be analyzed um, individually and make sure, that the, uh, make sure that we understand fully the biological impacts of each particular source of rock on each particular ecosystem. Um, I had a question that I put in the chat, but I can also say it out loud. Can you um, um, maybe just walk through the process a little bit more? So I, from a prior you know, presentation, you said it's, it's roughly like a ton of olivine is needed to capture a ton of CO2. Um, and, um, you know, it, this whole project sounds so awesome, but at the same time, it's hard to picture like transporting and grinding a, a metric ton of olivine and then distributing it on the beach, like how is that done? All for like ten dollars. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, and you know, probably don't have time now to go into all the detail on the cost estimates, but we, we've done we've done significant work there. But just to give you a sense, basically the olivine is ground at source, so it's extracted, and it's usually fairly near the surface. It's it's been grind ground and grinding machines. Um, we don't have to grind it down too fine because the wave action does that for us then loaded onto self-unloading ships. So, you know, at scale, this will basically be transported by large, you know, bulk carriers and then uh, unloaded directly from those ships into coastal waters. And so that's one of the things that means we can do it efficiently. If we had to take it to a port and then truck it to the beach, uh, that would be a lot less efficient. Uh, but at scale, it can be unloaded directly from ships. Got it. So like, a, like some sort of like a hopper in the bottom of the boat it just... You just sprinkle it on the seafloor as you as you dr sail along the coastline. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'm just I'm just reading the chat, and uh, yeah. I'm just going to address a couple of other questions if I have time, Alison. Yes, there's Kristen so, Draft and Stan Whittingham. 
If you, uh, uh, Christian, Joachim, and Stan Wittingham, if you want to give some context on your questions, feel free to do so. Yeah, but mine's a very short question. What are the usual impurities in olivine? And this really addresses one of the earlier questions. The the uh, most uh, the the most um, common impurity is nickel. Uh, so olivine is less than one percent nickel, but that's still enough for us to for us to be want to be very careful about monitoring that. So we're going to be measuring con uh, concentrations of nickel and other metals in the water and also in tissues of um, of local organisms. Um, there's some pretty good evidence that the nickel will generally not be bioavailable um, in the way it goes into solution, uh, but something to be monitoring. Uh, I'm just going to, I know we don't have much time, so I'm just going to very quickly touch on the other questions here. Social acceptability, so it's an important question. Um, the green sand peaches, um, the, the few green sand peaches that already exist through olivine in the world naturally are generally uh, beautiful places, uh, that, or without exception, generally beautiful places with, uh, which are tourist attractions in their own right. So people actually like these places. Uh, nonetheless, it is an important question and we want to make sure that there's a social license here uh, for, for doing this. One advantage we have with this is that once we get to scale, uh, we're going to be spreading olivine in coastal waters, and it doesn't actually have to be on the beach. So we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of green sand beaches all around the world. Uh, we're talking about green sand beaches mostly for our pilot and demonstration sites. Um, uh, yes, but to, to complete the, my question is the fact that you need, if you have, you need, for example, you present Europe between UK and France, 35,000 of cost. Uh, how you will practically convince all the government to go on the process? So, I mean, I think the um, if, if we can deliver carbon removal for ten dollars a ton, we're going to get to a point where we're going to we're going to be willing as a society to make some trade-offs, right? And so, if that involves some green sand washing up on a beach. Then you know that that's I think likely to be a um, trade-off we're likely to make, be willing to make as a society, and this also, by the way, gets into Tom Chi's question uh, about ecological disruption. So um, I certainly agree there's there's potential for ecological disruption. We don't yet know the the full impact of doing this. Of course, uh, as many of you know, olivine. Uh, not only captures carbon dioxide, it also deacidifies the ocean. And there's really good evidence that that is actually likely to be supportive for uh, for a lot of species in marine ecosystems. Um, so we need to understand the both positive and adverse effects of doing this. Um, and you know, it is a uh, it is an excellent question about confidence in the um, confidence in the understanding of the ecological effects in the time frame we have. Um, you know, we expect each study to take to take a couple of years. We're going to be running multiple in parallel. So we think that, you know, over the next handful of years, we're going to have a pretty good understanding of the ecological effects of this. This is not something that takes, you know, 10 or 20 years to understand the ecology. It's going to take a few years. Um, you know, awesome. in terms of the level of trade-off, that's going to be a that's going to be a, a decision for ultimately, I think, scientists and governments to make. Right? Like, are we willing to take some damage to uh, to reverse climate change? Probably some, but you know, we'd rather minimize that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.